They're screening all health care workers before they present to work in the nursing home to make sure that the people charged with caring for our elderly loved ones are not the ones bringing the, trans bringing the virus into them. And likewise with visitors, that is why it seems so harsh, but it's why we have to keep visitors out. We know that visitors wanting to see loved ones are also transmitting this virus, bringing it into the nursing home, again, putting at risk the people that they care for. Limiting visitors will decrease the possibility of this virus affecting our most vulnerable and will limit the spread. These actions are not taken lightly and are not meant to be cruel. Quite the contrary, we're trying to take care of our residents. It will take every single person in our community to do their part to break this cycle. We have to break the cycle of disease transmission. That means if you're ill and you're otherwise healthy and you think you probably were exposed to a COVID case, but, but you're, you're healthy, you can, you can weather this illness. You don't need a test. Assume you have COVID and stay home. Stay home and don't transmit it to another person. We need to keep those hospital beds for critically ill people and not for people who would have gotten well on their own at home. If we can keep those beds available, we don't want to see a situation where we have more people that need a bed than we have beds and have to decide who gets care and who doesn't. So that's what we mean when we say flattening the curve. We don't want to overwhelm our healthcare capacity. And so people who can stay home and be safely, again, there's no specific medicine. So if you can stay home and weather it out, you are doing a tremendous part in creating a bed for someone who really needs it and whose life can be saved. So everyone has a role. If you have a mild illness and you're healthy, stay home. Stay home till you're well. If you're a senior, stay home. You have earned the right to stay home and have one of your community members drop some food off for you at your door. Let the community work for you to keep you safe at home, away from gatherings and large groups that could put you at a significant risk. If you're a kid and you're home from school, which is all of our kids, don't undermine the school closures by now creating play dates with a bunch of your friends that you would have been at school. That just negates the benefit of the school closure. If you're a tween, the same thing. Don't call everyone over and, and socialize. We've got to limit our exposure at all levels, every age. The fewer people you're exposed to, the lower your chance of uh, contracting the virus and then transmitting it. The drastic steps we're taking now are what we have to do. Closing the schools, closing the restaurants, but it will decrease the number of people who become infected, and that's what we want. With fewer people infected, there's less illness. With less illness, fewer people need care. With less people needing care, less people needing ICU beds, which of course are limited. We can't strain our healthcare system beyond its limits and then be choosing who gets care and who doesn't. Let me start um, by thanking Team IDPH, the Illinois Department of Public Health. We usually work behind the scenes, right? We uh, are looking out, surveilling for pertussis. We're keeping track of HIV rates. We're making sure people are getting their medicines. We like to do our work in the background, but right now we're front and center, and we've had to ramp up our efforts to be able to handle this new COVID-19. We were the first state and the, the first public health uh, laboratory to be able to run this test, and it helped us to identify infections quickly without having to send it to the CDC. We've been working around the clock with meetings starting at the 7 a.m. hour till meetings at 11 and calls going into the wee hours of the morning. Again, I'm just saluting all of my team IDPH members and saying thank you for the tireless days. People have been working seven days a week for weeks now. I also want to thank the local health departments. They are boots on the ground for their hard work and their response to the outbreak. 
They are critical in our effort to limit the spread. The local health departments will have the most up-to-date numbers because of the rapidly increasing number of cases and coming from different places. You know, we are running the tests. We have individual hospitals that are running their own tests. We have commercial labs that are running their tests. But we are trying to assimilate all of those test results, and that takes time. So we can't update our website in real time. We'll be updating it once a day. But if you look at your local health departments, you might see their information updated quicker than our daily update. Again, we'll have these t daily press briefings so that we can keep you up to date and let you know what is happening. In the meantime, I want you to know that we are not able to break down the information for you necessarily by county, but again, uh, use your local health departments who will be able to update their information more regularly. I again want to ask everyone to do their part and help us break the cycle of spread. And that means staying home as much as possible. It will take every single one of us making every sacrifice that we can to reduce the spread of this virus and free up our healthcare system to care for those who need it most. Every action each of us takes as an individual has an effect on the entire community. Let's take as many actions as possible to help our community weather this extraordinary situation with the lowest loss of precious lives as possible. And now I'll briefly uh, review my comments for our Spanish-speaking population. Hola, me llamo Ngozi Ezike y yo soy la directora del Departamento de Salud Pública en Illinois. Como dijo el gobernador, ahora tenemos 288 casos en 17 condados en todos Illinois. Los números seguirán creciendo y anticipamos muertos adicionales. Esa es la realidad. Ayer reportamos el primer brote en un asilo de ancianos en Illinois. Los residentes del asilo de ancianos son nuestra población más vulnerable y con gran riesgo de enfermedades graves y, y también muerte. Para prevenir la transmisión del virus en estos lugares, Debemos prevenir infección a los trabajadores que cuidan a esos residentes. Cada persona tiene que hacer su parte para romper el ciclo de transmisión de COVID-19. Si está enfermo, queda en casa. Si está solo un poco enferma y es una persona saludable, probablemente es COVID. Pero no lo necesita una prueba y no lo necesita ir al hospital. Mantener su distancia, seis pieces entre tres personas. Evitar eventos. Mucha gente en el mismo lugar aumenta el riesgo de encontrar COVID-19. Los, los drásticos pasos que estamos tomando ahora, como cerrar escuelas y restaurantes, van a ayudar a reducir la cantidad de personas que se infectan y proteger a las personas con mayor riesgo de enfermarse gravemente. Con menos personas infectadas, hay menos enfermedades. Con menos enfermedades, menos personas necesitan atención médica. Con menos personas que necesitan atención médica, menos vamos una, una atención en nuestro sistema médica y podríamos servir a los que más lo necesitan. Realmente, todos tenemos que hacer estos sacrificios para reducir la transmisión del virus en Illinois. Vamos a hacerlos juntos. Gracias. And with that, I will turn it over now to Director Tate Nadeau of the Emergency Management Agency. Thank you, Dr. Azike. And I'd like to thank uh, Governor Pritzker for his leadership during this very difficult time. And I would also like to turn behind me and thank my partners here in emergency management for all that they do. You know, relationships like this are not born overnight. But what we do see is that whenever we have a situation like we have now that is ever evolving, those relationships that are tried and true and have been tested are then even stronger whenever we get into a situation like today. So I would like to absolutely thank our local partners here today. Uh, it really is where we make a difference. 
uh, in our communities as at the local level. So I would definitely uh, thank you for that. Today, the role of emergency management is to support our state and local health departments to coordinate the state resources used to respond and recover from this disaster. Behind the scenes, we are using what we refer to as a whole community approach to support and respond to an unprecedented health crisis. Right now, the State, of Emer state Emergency Operations Center is working with more than 56 state partners and 108 counties, along with mutual aid partners and federal counterparts to address the needs of our local communities. Through careful collaboration, all counties in Illinois now have a thorough housing plan to address the needs of their residents during this disaster. As we speak, we have teams that are, and subject matter experts that are building response plans for days and weeks ahead as we, ex as we explore the novel corona spread across our state. Another key initiative that the state of Illinois is working on is through Illinois Public Health and to prioritize the resource requests that we have for personal protective equipment. And to communicate other methods get, can be employed to protect against the disease. No nurse, doctor, paramedic, or first responder should ever go without the equipment they need to do their job. Our agencies and this administration remain committed to finding timely solutions to the necessary resources to mitigate the potential for shortages. Also working behind the scenes is our Business Emergency Operations Center. We have all seen photos online of bare store shelves. There have been a lot of warnings about dangers of hoarding, and I'd like to echo those sentiments. In response to these reckless actions, we have activated our Business Emergency Operations Center to work with our private sector partners to address any supply chain needs identified in our communities. We are currently working with over 220 individuals and 150 private sector organizations, over 16 critical infrastructure sectors. Rest assured, that our Illinois retailers and our private sector partners are just as committed to the state of Illinois to identify and address these needs. Now I'd like to turn the podium over to Chairman Larkin. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Keith Larkin and I'm the chairman of the Jackson County Board. I would first like to thank the governor and his staff for making this stop in Southern Illinois a priority and for their tireless efforts fighting this pandemic. I want to take this opportunity to address those folks living in Jackson County specifically and to let you know what we are doing to try to protect you. The board has been working hand in hand with our public health, law enforcement, and emergency management agencies to implement the recommendations of the CDC and the state public health department. I want to assure you that our people in those leadership roles are as capable and qualified as any in the state. It is our goal to make public communication a priority during these uncertain times. When we have information and recommendations, you will know. Please follow the Jackson County Health Department and Jackson County EMA websites and Facebook pages for the most up-to-date information. The county is trying to lead by example when it comes to on-site staff reduction and social distancing. Essential functions of the county and the courts will continue to operate. However, I have made the recommendation that the county offices reduce staff to only those absolutely necessary, and if conditions require, we may close those offices completely. As of this moment, there are no known cases of COVID-19 in Jackson County. Your efforts to implement social distancing recommendations are a big reason for that, and I urge you to continue to follow them and any new guidelines that come out. I also want to thank Jackson County Clerk Frank Byrd and his staff for successfully holding an election yesterday. I know the circumstances were uniquely challenging, but it is important that we continue to hold up our American ideals through these times. In closing, I just want to remind everyone that we're in this together. The best part of living in Southern Illinois is the community. Certainly you should follow the guidelines from health officials, but don't let fear steal your humanity. Don't miss an opportunity to check on friends and family. Make sure your elderly neighbors are taken care of. 
Support local businesses any way you can. We are going to get through this together. Make sure that when this is over, your stories are stories of kindness and community. Thank you very much, um, and I'd like to turn it back over to the governor for questions from the press. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say just for a moment, um, Chairman Larkin, thank you for your leadership. It takes leadership at all levels for us to manage through this challenge, and I am extraordinarily grateful. All the people who stand behind me uh, today and who lead their communities are doing uh, what I think is necessary, which is leading with calm, uh, understanding, and also with planning and organization to make sure that we can get through this together, and we will. We will get through this. So happy to take any questions from members of the press. Yes, sir. Yeah, Governor, a couple questions. Uh, first, in the Italy, you touched on it and made headlines in St. Clair County. So it's a real possibility, not going to happen now, but a real possibility we could end up in a lockdown like Italy? What I would say is that we should look at the mistakes that were made in Europe uh, when this, as this crisis was coming upon them, uh, as this coronavirus was spreading. Uh, and we should, uh, it should be a cautionary tale to all of us that we need to uh, make sure that we're distancing ourselves, socially distancing ourselves, that people are isolating themselves when they feel, you know, that they might have even a cold. Uh, please stay home. If you have the flu, please stay home. If you don't feel well, please stay home because here's why. Yes, you may not have the coronavirus, but if you get somebody else sick and then they get coronavirus, or if you get coronavirus while you are sick with the flu or a cold, your risk goes up significantly. And you're putting other people at risk when you go out and potentially transmit whatever it is that you may have. And by the way, you should just assume that you may have coronavirus. Just assume that. What would you do? You should self-isolate. That is the right thing to do. So. Um, if you're not feeling well, stay home. My point in pointing to Europe is we need to avoid what happened in Italy. And we need to take the actions now to make sure that we do that. About the National Guard, 64 National Guard people, the way you quoted or relayed was that these people are going to serve meals to kids who can't get it. That sure doesn't seem like enough people to cover all of downstate and Chicago. No, we, we have activated only 60 at this point. As you know, we have 13,000 in our National Guard. We will activate as we need, and you'll be seeing that over time, there's no doubt. We need more manpower for a variety of functions. I think I may have mentioned at a previous press conference uh, that there are things like, for example, uh, building tents outside of hospital emergency rooms and health center uh, emergency areas so that people with respiratory illnesses can go one direction while people who might have a heart attack or some other thing that they need to be treated in an emergency room for can go another direction. We need our National Guard perhaps to help us build those tents. So that's an example of functions the National Guard will fulfill. I was simply listing one of the many functions. Is 60 enough to do everything we need? Likely not. But we just began to call up certain elements of the National Guard. Governor. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So why hasn't that happened yet? Well, it now has happened. You know, what, what, what happened, uh, just so you know, the bill only passed a few days ago that allowed us to do that. So we made sure that we, you know, put in the paperwork so we're in line to get those loans for our small businesses. Look, I want to do everything we can. I was a business person before I became governor. I understand what this is doing to many businesses across the state of Illinois. Um, this coronavirus is damaging people in a variety of ways, right? Their health, their safety, and their livelihoods. And so we want to do whatever we can to mitigate that damage. Does that put us behind the other states? No. We offer less money? No, it flips on the switch is what it does. It allows us to access those loans. Now, let me be clear, there is a, another bill that's coming. And in fact, earlier today, I was on the phone with the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives uh, to talk to her about what we will need in that coming bill 
things like, for example, support for Medicaid, because we want to make sure we can extend health care to people who may not have it today. They may not have already received Medicaid certification um, and people who are underinsured. We want everybody to get the health care they need during this crisis. Of course, you're going to translate them into English, I hope. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Governor, the Illinois General Assembly website still this session next week, starting on the 24th. Has that been canceled? Do you have any plans to call a special session to bring legislators in to work on stimulus packages? What are your thoughts? Uh, I, the legislature is going to make a decision for itself whether it will come in next week. I know that's a schedule that, they're, that they currently have. Um, but I think things have evolved rapidly, as you've seen. So I, I will leave that up to the Senate president, the minority leader of the Senate, the speaker, and the minority leader of the House. Uh, uh, as to the question of whether I would call a special session, um, I, I think, again, we need to make sure that we're doing this in, um, in a way that's healthy and safe. You know that when you open up the Capitol, you're not just talking about the 177 members of the General Assembly that come. And that's a gathering that you is suggested not to happen, according to all the guidelines and, of course, the order that I gave here in Illinois. Um, but uh, it also includes lobbyists and other people and staff people, the many staff people who work in the Capitol. So uh, it is very important for the legislature to, to take that into account, uh, to consider what the, you know, the right thing to do for the legislature is. Uh, and so I'll work with them on that. We, we need to work together. Yes. The uh, city of Chicago is now automatically denying all FOIA requests. Uh, do you have any plans to suspend FOIA during this situation, or what would you be in favor of? No, we'll, we'll continue to respond to FOIA requests. I mean, I would ask members of the media and the public who put in FOIA requests to have some patience, because we do have people working at home. We are, you know, f we have fewer staff people in the office able to access the kinds of documents that people are looking for in their FOIA requests. So hopefully people will be a bit patient, but we intend to fulfill FOIA requests. Do you think the city should deny the requests? Look, I, I, the city has a different plan for how many people will be working at the office. And, you know, the decision making at the city is different than, than ours maybe, but, I, you know, I know what, what works for us. I don't know how they fulfill their FOIA. I know how many staff people we have available to do it. We're going to try to fulfill those. We just need people to give us a, you know, a, a little bit of leeway. This, I'm gonna take this one, I'll come over here. Uh, you listed a few things. If I forget a few, you'll remind me. Um, uh, let me start with unemployment. You asked about how quickly uh, people could get unemployment. We've actually worked very hard to narrow the time that it takes. First of all, people can go to the IDES website. That's our Illinois Department of Employment Security, IDES.Illinois.gov. Uh, to apply for uh, unemployment online. We also have our offices, which we've taken um, what we would call non-essential staff, and we've asked them to, to come to the front lines and help out so that people who come in in person and need to have an application filled out and need help, um, that we've got the right staffing because we realize there are going to be more people than usual uh, asking for unemployment. We've also narrowed uh, the amount of time that it takes, uh, uh, tried to get rid of the bureaucracy here so that we can deliver unemployment. We've also, just to point out, you know, this is, as you can imagine, uh, this is something we need help from the federal government for, too. Uh, and so we've asked that in the package that they're passing that there is an additional uh, amount of unemployment available. That's what we think is the right way to handle this current situation. We, the, the, the dollars that will go to the American public should go to people who are being laid off, for example, um, and not to people who continue to have a job. Uh, and so we've asked that, the, that unemployment be um, uh, sent, you know, unemployment dollars be sent to the state to cover that. Uh, so you asked about uh, 
Evictions, thank you. And utility shops, that's a great question. So um, uh, we've actually been reaching out, and I know there are sheriffs that are reaching out to other sheriffs across the state uh, to try to get all the sheriffs to uh, come together in this idea that we, we should have no evictions during this time period. So um, that's something that we're working very hard to, uh, to, you know, to get ha to happen. Um, as to utility shutoffs, I've made calls personally to the CEOs and uh, leaders of our largest utilities across the state, uh, as well as employed our Interstate Commerce Commission to make that same plea. And we have succeeded in getting the utilities to agree uh, to uh, a moratorium on shutoffs of utilities during this time period. Uh, some of them uh, for a relatively lengthy time period, I might add. Um, and they're really, they're doing the right thing. And I just want to add in that moment uh, about that particular topic that uh, the, the, the companies uh, and individuals that I've reached out to across the state uh, and ask them to make some sacrifices like um, not doing collections during this time period, like giving employees a little extra something as the, if they have to do any kind of uh, workforce reduction. Um, uh, or asking them simply to close, uh, as I did with the, you know, early on, it seems like a long time ago, the professional sports teams, right? The amount of money that they lose when they don't hold games and so on. Even back then, when that, that seems like a long time ago, I think, to everybody here, uh, but even back then, the, the team owners were saying, it's the right thing to do, I'll do it, even though many of them would lose millions of dollars. The bar owners and restaurant owners, I know small business people suffer during this time period when they're not open. Um, the tipped workers um, uh, suffer not having the opportunity. So I, I, people are making sacrifices everywhere. We're trying to take care of the people most in need at this moment. We're trying to mitigate the damage that this coronavirus is doing to small businesses and others. And we're asking those who can afford it to, um, to make some accommodation uh, to help people out because that is the moment that we're living in, everybody. We, we have got to stand up for each other. Uh, and I'm making that plea to people across the state of Illinois, and they're responding in spades. Governor, how, how is it going getting enough test kits to get the job done and successful? Getting enough, I'm sorry. Yeah, testing kits. Testing kits, yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, this is a, one of the biggest challenges we've faced, frankly. I, I would describe this as the biggest challenge we've faced so far. Um, testing is so vital for a variety of reasons. I know everybody would like to get tested, but put, put aside that for a moment. Sentinel surveillance, in other words, being able to see where the outbreaks are taking place across the state, being able to separate people who are, uh, uh, who are test positive and are uh, in a community of vulnerable people. Um, that's a very important thing to do. If you don't have tests, you don't know where to go to make those uh, adjustments. And uh, that's what's happened. And that's a, and that, I mean, I would, you can trace it all back. I think all of you have read in the news. You could trace it all back to a decision uh, not to, to use the WHO, the World Health Organization's test that they were using. There are hundreds of thousands of people getting tested, millions of people really, across the world that are getting tested today, uh, but not in the United States. Um, and uh, it's because a decision was made early on to choose to, you know, grow our own, to create our own test in, in, uh, in the United States. And, and that's taken a long time in the supply chain for it wasn't ready. Uh, so that's been a real challenge. Okay, so going forward, that's the history. Going forward, we, we have done amazing work. I mean, I want to point specifically at the Department of Public Health and their labs, uh, but I also want to uh, say my staff and the governor's office have been working very hard. I've made personal calls to the CEOs of pharma companies, of uh, medical supply companies, uh, to try and get a hold of the supplies that we need, which have mostly been monopolized by the federal government and delayed in their distribution. Uh, and so I'm trying to essentially grab whatever part of the supply chain I can for the state of Illinois. That's who I care about. I care about the people in this state. I'm gonna work every day, day and night to make sure we get what we need. CEOs around the country, especially ones that have facilities and do business in the state of Illinois and know us, have been very willing to step up and help us out, to, to take pieces of their supply and send it to us even separate from what they're doing uh, across the rest of the United States, not putting us in line, but putting us a little bit ahead of the line in the last few days. So we've increased our testing capability. I just heard that one of our labs uh, today at 1230 received 
uh, the ability to do thousands more tests uh, because of work that was done by our staff. And so I'm very um, happy to say that we're, we're, we're be able to do more tests. It's still not enough, to be clear. You talk about thousands of tests. We need to be able to test many more people than that. Now, I believe the federal government, which has been trying very hard for a long time to expand testing, is almost there. Um, they keep telling me that. I believe that now that maybe in the next three days that we're going to start to see thousands and thousands and thousands more tests for the state of Illinois. So I will keep reporting to you what I know and what I hear. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I feel a little bit sometimes like Charlie Brown uh, with Lucy and the football um, with the federal government because there are some terrific people who work at the federal government. There are people at the CDC you know, and in the, you know, in the second and third rungs at, at the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington who are trying very hard to do the right thing. And those are the people that I'm trying to talk to and implore uh, to help us in the state of Illinois. And we're getting some pretty good response from that. So in many of the uh, operations that you're talking about, uh, the uh, developmentally disabled, the you know, people who live in congregate situations and so on, um, we're trying to um, set a tone for all the facilities that they need to be careful about who they're letting in the door, um, making sure that they're looking at people and asking them if they've been traveling or if they have any symptoms and so on. We don't want this to happen at any of our facilities across the state, private or public. Um, and of course, we're on a special alert around our senior citizens who are very, very vulnerable. Um, and so we're, we're doing the best we can, but it is up to everybody across the state, those who own and operate facilities privately, as well as the people who live in congregate situations, to take good care of themselves, to follow the recommendations that we've made, to go to our website at coronavirus dot illinois dot gov to learn about how they should be uh, operating and that they should be isolating themselves especially if they're vulnerable and the person, uh, any thought about early release or you know in a the same kind of theory of like jail you know, sure. not by the centers what's the yep. recommendation yep. that pertains to those places so we the question was about um about our prisoners in the state of illinois um those where it's hard to distance socially uh, uh, we're taking special care. We're doing the best we can. I'm looking at, um, you know, at uh, our prisons and uh, and the health care that's available in those prisons, as well as, um, you know, how we can isolate people if we do find somebody who has uh, COVID-19. Uh, so that's something, and I'll give some credit to our director of the Department of Corrections, who's been thinking about this actually for some time and has, has developed a plan for each of the facilities. Uh, you know, they're implementing the plan is sometimes hard. Our facilities are quite old in the state of Illinois. Um, we have some that are more than 100 years old. They've been renovated over time, but they're still not built for something like this. So we're doing the best we can uh, to, to keep the prisoners safe, as well as, very importantly, uh, the people who work in the prisons themselves, uh, the, the, you know, the terrific uh, officers and, and uh, staff at the prisons. Yeah, and we've you know we've looked at at uh, what types of people we think should be considered eligible for that. Um, you know, uh, that's uh, that's something that I'm always looking about um, because our our you know we sh we should do something about the nearly forty thousand prisoners that we have in the state of Illinois. Um, having said that, there are some very dangerous people who should not be considered. Um, but there are others that are very vulnerable and who have committed some nonviolent offense uh, and who should be first in line if we were to do something like that. Do you yes, have a question? I think this gentleman actually asked earlier. Can you talk about progress the Carbondale Labs has made? Have they been able to test anybody in Southern Illinois for COVID-19? Yeah, so I'm going to turn it over to the doctor who runs the IDPH and, the, and the oversees the folks who work in the lab. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for that question. So. Um, our Chicago lab was the first lab to uh, be testing for COVID in the state, and we were the first uh, public health lab in the country to start testing. And so soon after, we gave, we gave the ability uh, to test 
for COVID-19 also to our Spring Springfield lab as well as our Carbondale lab. And so there's a capacity to test 60 to 100 samples a day. And so they've been doing that at the Carbondale lab. And so, yes, we've been getting tests through there. And sometimes the Chicago specimens are shipped to Carbondale to be run. So all labs are working to, to get specimens tested. Dr. Thank you, Yeah, let me take that if I if I may. Um, so we're working very hard. We've talked to a variety of the counties uh, and their leadership about during this time period, how can we care better for people who are homeless? Look, this is a problem whether we have coronavirus or not. And in, in this moment, especially, we want to make sure that we're keeping people safe from the virus. Um, so we have conversations going around. And, and indeed, I had one this morning on this subject about facilities, because we're looking at facilities where we may need to uh, isolate some people, right, who've been identified as being near somebody or in, you know, uh, the same building or the same office uh, as somebody else who's been tested positive, and they need to isolate perhaps from their own family, so we want to provide housing. We should also be providing housing, as you are, I think, suggesting. For homeless people and so we're looking at that and all the facilities that you know we might be spinning up uh that to provide those beds and i would just point at our uh at our brigadier general tate nadeau who runs our emergency management agency because they are looking at all those facilities they're actually responsible for evaluating where would we put beds where would we put people um, and considering how we might uh, house the homeless. So thank you for asking the question. We're doing a lot of work in this regard. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. to ensure that Illinoisans aren't saddled with debt if they're unable to pay their bills during this crisis. Here in Residents Illinois, are being isolated either in a separate wing of the facility or in the hospital. And staff the new that rules are positive will go into effect are Friday furloughed at, at home. Test. These restrictions will be adjusted subject to conditions on the ground. There will be exemptions for Americans who are in and out of these facilities as they provide care to these residents.